Picking up where we left off in the previous episode, after looking at alignment, rods, the keystone effect, monitors, wireless video, and remote follow focus, we'll address the fact that our rig has way too many batteries, then discuss the pros and cons of using a mat box. Right now, we have three NPF batteries powering the monitor, transmitter, and follow focus. These three, plus the camera battery, are a lot of batteries to keep track of. Whenever any of these batteries dies, I lose the shot. I'd rather center all this power from one source so the entire rig refreshes as one. My choice here is a V-Lock battery with various extra ports. I'm a big fan of powering accessories through USB-C, but we'll also need a D-Tap port. Let's start by attaching the battery to the rig through the rails. This also creates a good counterweight for larger lenses and adapters, improving our center of gravity. A few folks like to have the battery right up against the back of the camera, but I prefer to still have access to the screen and buttons. The choice is yours, as you can opt to send all the information and menus over to the external monitor for adjusting settings. With the V-Lock battery in place, I'll start shedding the NPFs. The first one to go is the wireless transmitter, which will be replaced by a USB to USB-C cable. The monitor takes a DTAP barrel to cable, and we can use another USB cable for the follow focus. But what if you're using different parts from me? Something that can reliably power all the pieces are DTAP to something, connectors. Since the battery only has one DTAP port, I'll bring in a DTAP splitter and Velcro it to the back of the battery mount. With these four DTAP ports, we can use the proper adapters to feed the camera, follow focus, monitor, and transmitter. With this configuration, swapping the V-Lock powers every part of the rig without worries about differing batteries dying at different times. One very important aspect of using DTAPs is to watch the polarity of the connectors. Pay attention to the corners of the male side and how they fit, making sure to never ever force them the wrong way as that will fry your gear, seriously. After this little scare, I want to point out that many focus motors benefit from higher voltage than the standard USB cable can deliver, requiring special cables like this USB-C to DTAP by small rig, which delivers up to nine volts to a USB-C port instead of the meager default five volts. This greatly increases the motor's torque to rotate a lens's harder focus ring. If a V-Lock battery is too big or pricey for your style, you can opt for an NPF hub. It relies on more USB power, but you can still use a D-Tap splitter. The main difference is NPF batteries won't last nearly as long as a V-Lock. If that works for you, or if you're not using all these accessories I have rigged up, because let's say you don't need a monitor, then you're fine. My last note on power before we move on to mat boxes, the biggest telltale your batteries are running low is the follow focus motor will start to struggle by either being slow or weak or not moving at all, even though the lights are on. Don't get spooked, nothing is broken. You just need more juice. The rig now has a ton of cables everywhere. HDMI, power, power, more power, another HDMI, you get it. Our goal while building the camera is to keep them all neat and tidy and as out of the way as possible. For that, we can use Velcros, zip ties, bongo ties, or more elaborate, read pricey, cable management solutions. Regardless of your choice, keep it clean and straight. Under this video, you will find a link to a 3D printable cable manager, which takes a quarter inch slot and a screw. I used to hate mat boxes. In fact, most times I find myself without one. And there are several reasons for it. But before we get into it, let's look at the basics. What does a mat box do? And why do I care? Mat boxes are a product of the all optical artifacts are bad mentality before we embraced lens flares as cool. They are the ultimate tool for flare control. The eyebrow and sides flags tray light from the lens. Hard mats, those square cutouts that go into a mat box, serve for flare control as well. Besides flares, 
Matte boxes have filter trays for square and sometimes round filters. These filters are much larger than your average screw-on filter, and since the matte box goes in front of every lens for a film, you waste no time removing individual filters from one lens and attaching them to another. You also have independent access to each filter as opposed to screw-on filters where you have to take out the frontmost filters to reach the ones in the back. There are essentially two types of matte boxes, swing away and clip on. A rail mounted matte box is something in between the two worlds without the conveniences of either. Swing away matte boxes are mounted to the rails of the rig and have a mechanism that allows them to swing out of the way for fast lens changes. They used to be the industry standard and they worked great because lens sets were mostly consistent in size, plus film cameras always weighed a ton. So what's another five pounds for a matte box, right? <laughs> Yet gear keeps getting lighter and so did matte boxes. Swingaways lost their precious position in favor of clip-on matte boxes that just clip on to the front of the lens. This requires some standards as the lenses must have consistent front sizes. The alternative is that the matte box has a handful of different backs which can fit multiple lens sizes. In general, clip-on matte boxes are much lighter than swingaways and easier to attach and remove from the rig as needed. On a lens swap, the matte box has to be removed first, then the lens swap happens, and the first AC reattaches the matte box to the front of the new lens. Now, why did I always end up without a matte box? Well, at first, it was because they were incredibly expensive. Then, I finally got one, but the sucker was just so big and heavy for my DSLR rig that I just hated using it. Then, there was the problem that I had no square filters. In fact, most 4x4 or 4x565 filters were much pricier than screw-on filters, and uh, they still are. After overcoming all of this during the last decade, I still have a hard time with matte boxes. The reason being not so much the matte box, but the lenses themselves. Unless we're talking about cinema design lenses, we're still on the way to standardizing front sizes for clip-on matte boxes. So I have lenses that go from 80mm outer diameter to 114mm outer diameter. Fortunately, this problem has a solution, which are these rings that go around the smaller lenses and make them compatible with the larger matte box back. The standard outer diameter sizes for cinema lenses are 80mm, 95mm, 114mm, oh, and 138mm for really unpleasant situations. So getting a clip-on matte box in one of those sizes is the way to go. Small Rig offers various options, and right here I'm using the Arcane with a 114mm back and a set of different size adapters. Since we're focusing on clip-on matte boxes, here's an issue you are likely to encounter. Most lenses, especially vintage ones, have a simplistic approach to mechanical design. The result is that clipping a matte box to the front of the lens is going to create a lever effect onto the helicoid, much like the keystone effect that we saw earlier, making it stiffer to move and even risking damage to the lens's internal mechanics. The solution for this is to either add support to your lens or to mount the matte box on the rails so the lens doesn't take the brunt of the weight, sliding the matte box back and forth for every lens change. Most matte boxes have two or three filter stages, and one of the cool things about the Arcane is that I can expand this as much as I want. Not that it's a great idea to do so, but it's something you can do in extreme circumstances, I don't know. <laughs> this also influences the front weight issue that I was talking about just a minute ago though. The final thing to look at matte boxes is how they can affect your bokeh. Since we're going all the way to ensure smooth oval bokeh, I would hate for you to find out that it's not as smooth as expected because of the matte box. The eyebrow and hard mats are designed to block stray light. The catch is sometimes blocking that flare also acts as an unexpected mechanical aperture in front of the lens. You can see the result of this on several scenes where one side of the autofocus highlights is a straight line. So whenever using these tools, evaluate if they are the best way to control pesky flares or if preserving bokeh is more important. Each project might call for a different decision on this choice. 
Many times I'll be shaving weight off the rig to put it up on a gimbal, like we'll do in the next episode. And the matte box is usually the first thing to go. When in a pinch, a lot of the accessories we discussed in the last two episodes will be ditched or repositioned to lessen the load on the gimbal, allowing us to have an easier balancing experience. But that's not for today. For now, it's enough to have a good understanding of different approaches to power for your rig, choose your matte boxes, picking your ideal monitor, plus follow focus and wireless video. If you have any questions about the gear used in the last episodes, make sure to leave a comment below. And if you're riveted by what's happening in this module and you need more cookbook in your life, click on the join button below to become part of the Anna Budget crew, getting instant access to the last two episodes in this module, plus an invite to our awesome Discord server where we discuss gear choices, creative approaches, and lots more of filmmaking topics. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. Chit fadings, out.